I'm John Johnson, and I'm a delegate here. I'm a delegate here for the uh, for the COP conference. Uh, I'm here to inform you all that you're doing it all wrong. Okay? Now we have all of the answers, and we can guarantee you, we can guarantee that there will be no further problems in regard in regards to the climate crisis. Okay? So I'm going to start with uh, with our four part. We've got a four part plan. Okay, a four part plan. That's four. One, two, three, and four part plan to resolve all of the inverted commas issues that we have with the inverted commas climate crisis. Now, I would like to begin with number one. Firstly, we're going to plant a trillion trees. How does that sound? Yeah? What, what, that, that would work, right? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Planting trees, trees are important. We all know trees are important. Our natural ecosystems absorb a quarter of all our emissions, and we simply cannot get out of this climate crisis without conserving and restoring nature. And so you will hear people like Mr. Johnson saying that all we need to do is plant some trees. And tree planting is a hugely popular solution. It's cheap, it's easy, you get a nice photo up with the politician and his, his spade. You can even get the community out to help you and you have a nice day out. And of course, trees are good. Trees are fantastic. They store carbon. They provide habitat for wildlife. They help reduce flooding. And of course, we love them. They give us amenity value. Trees make us happy. But while the right tree in the right place does all of those things, the wrong tree in the wrong place can be a disaster. Governments and other organizations around the world have made mass tree planting commitments in response to the climate crisis. But these commitments almost all involve the planting of industrial monocultures of non-native species. Anyone, anyone that has traveled around Scotland or Wales or the uplands of England knows that these industrial plantations of spruce are deserts for wildlife. They're dark and sterile, nothing lives there. You will see projections, scientific papers published talking about the potential of tree planting to solve the climate crisis. Unfortunately, the way these calculations are made is that they simply, they take a map of the earth, they find everywhere that's not farming or cities and that could possibly support trees, and they say all these areas could be planted. Unfortunately, most of those areas are existing biodiverse habitats, places like grasslands and fens and peat bogs and moors. And if you plant trees on a grassland, you're not planting a forest, you're destroying a grassland. So this is not careful in the way tree planting is done. It could be a disaster for biodiversity. Of course, it would be ridiculous to suggest that places like the Serengeti or the Masai Mara are planted under plantations of eucalyptus. But this is the sort of thing that will be proposed as an emergency climate action. Trees also take a long time to grow. They take a long time to absorb carbon. But if we're planting a tree now that's going to be mature in 50 years, the world is going to be very different in 50 years. And the conditions for that tree to survive might not grow. We're seeing that already with mass forest fires all around the world. There are projects, there are tree plantations that have been you know, established as carbon um, sequestration projects that have already been burned in forest fires. But the main thing is, well, two main things. Tree planting is a distraction from the much, much more important task of protecting the trees that we already have. Trees, you cannot create a forest. You can plant trees, but you cannot create a forest. Right now, we have lots of policy saying we should plant more trees, and yet we're letting the Amazon and the Congo Basin be cut down. This is nonsensical. Protecting the trees we have is much more important. And then finally, of course, 
the reason why people, politicians are so keen to sell tree planting is that it gives the impression that they are doing something while avoiding doing the only thing we really have to do, which is stop burning fossil fuels. So I'm not saying trees are not important. Trees are fantastic and we must increase forest cover. We should not do so through tree planting, we should do so through natural regeneration and this is not an alternative to stopping burning fossil fuels. We need to do both. Thank you. So take that, Mr. Johnson. Wait, wait, uh, well, with all due respect, uh, I don't know about all of you, but uh, I've, I've had enough of listening to the experts. No, no, oh. Right. Well, well. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does not matter because we have a four-point plan, and even if my tree plan is is no good to all of you lot, I've, I've got another idea, and that and that is around carbon capture technology and other innovations, which will solve everything. Okay? What do you think of that? Tell us more. What? Tell us more. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's go talk to the experts about that. I, I've left my notes at home. <laughs> so, this one's a particularly dangerous one. As you can probably hear from my accent, I'm from Australia. My country's delegation has come here with the message, sponsored by Santos, right? Santos is one of our biggest mining and carbon exporters in Australia. They have come with the message that carbon capture and storage is an integral part, in fact, one of the only strategies we have in combating this problem. Carbon capture and storage is not capable of meeting its own goals. Carbon capture and storage has missed every single one of its targets. In the year 2000, so what was that, COP5 or 6? We were promised by the political classes by 2020, we would be capturing 4,900 megatons of CO2 per year. 4,900 billion tonnes of CO2 would be being captured per year. Last year, we barely had 10 megatons. That's 0.2% of what was promised. This doesn't even show up on the graph, so you don't need to be a scientist to read this graph. I've brought it along. The blue line, or the purple line, is the emissions of CO2 since the year 1959. And by the way, the oil companies have known about this crisis since 1956. The CO2 emissions do not lie. We've heard a bunch of lies in this COP process, but that graph does not lie. And what the red line represents is the actual amount of uh, carbon being captured. Now, by the way, carbon dioxide is the only one of the greenhouse gases that we know how to capture and in any form, in any scalable form. The red line, as you can see, is, is, it doesn't even register a difference on that graph. So, worse still, this isn't even 0.3% of yearly emissions of CO2. Yearly emissions of CO2 are around 36 to 38,000 megatons. In 2000, we were promised 100 active CCS projects, carbon capture and storage projects, operating by 2020. We had six, six percent. These projects are unbelievably expensive. And who pays? The fossil fuel companies are privatizing these profits while the social cost of these projects is enormous. They've received enormous compensation and have consistently underperformed or failed in their operations. One plant in Australia captured just 1.8% of its target across five years. This uh, was run by the energy giant Chevron, and they received $60 million Australian dollars in compensation for that project. Canada spent over a billion Canadian dollars on a plant which averaged less than 60% of its target. Several expensive plants have been closed due to performance issues, technology issues, and reliability issues. And yet new projects being suggested by people, my government and John Johnson here are on the way. They're diverting taxpayer funds away from more effective projects such as clean energy, green infrastructure, insulation projects, clean transport projects, and towards these tax dodging polluting companies 
who promote other failed tech solutions such as hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen and CCUS. I guess the final point I would like to make is we've got a bathtub, right? And the bathtub is overflowing. The bathtub representing our climate uh, and a habit habitable planet. That bathtub will keep overflowing unless we turn the tap off. The tap being continued carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. You don't think of a plan of how you're going to mop up the water that's flowing onto the floor until you turn that tap off. That's the first thing you do. What carbon capture and storage is talking about doing is continuing this paradigm of emissions and that we can somehow fix the problem later with negative emissions technologies like that. It is not going to work. It is not scalable. It is not contributing to social just uh, a social just transition. It's a continuation of the exact type of, of failures that COP has delivered for 26 years and will keep doing. This is a very dangerous idea. I'm not saying it's, it's not going to form some part of the solution, but it alone is no silver bullet. And there's a very good reason that the fossil fuel companies are here promoting that technology. I want to leave you with that. Thank you. Yeah. Very, very well put, very well put. Um, no, no, of course, of course, of course. Um, but let's, let, let's stop for a moment, all right? Let's just stop for a moment and think about the money, okay? We need to think about our economy. With our economic growth, if we just, you know, maybe just forget about some of this stuff a little bit and focus on the money, think we, can, we can fix all of these problems with all of the cash that we're going to earn, right? No, 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 it will be fine. Of course, right, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that, that this scientist here could, uh, could, back, could back me up. Is, is, is that right? Lots of cash, that'll fix it, yes? Yes, sir? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> so, I think one thing that we consider is um, how much has the quality of life in Britain improved in the last 50 years? It's reduced! Most studies suggest that it's got worse for most people. People are less happy, less wealthy. Well, in that time, our economy has grown by a factor of 14. Yes. People should be 14 times better off, right? But growth isn't doing that for people, and it never will. In fact, it's going to do the opposite. So what I have here on this poster, thank you, Charlie. Um, that at the top there is a graph of different possible pathways that we could take socially, economically, politically. Um, and on the y-axis is the carbon emissions uh, that come from those different uh, policies. So. What I'm going to talk to you briefly about is what does the IPCC do, uh, what does it model, and what does it show us about how to approach for the future, and what that will show us, I think, is the discrepancy between what the science says is necessary and what the politicians are actually doing. Now, this top line here, this is, this is one possible pathway that humans could choose to take. That's pretty much the trajectory that we are on. That means rapidly rising carbon emissions, it means deregulation, it means lack, low investment in green technologies, and it means an infatuation with perpetual economic growth, exponential growth, and we're all used to what exponentials look like in the times of COVID. They tend to work out pretty badly. In fact, the only thing which grows exponentially is a cancer. And that's a good analogy for what economic growth is doing to this planet. It is destroying the host. And yet that is never talked about on the main political stage. The people who are meant to be making these decisions to protect life will not talk about this fundamental reality. We live on one planet, it is finite. You cannot keep exploiting it like this. It will collapse. And what this, this possible future entails is four to six degrees of heating. That's what the consequences are to the physical climate model, to the physical climate system. Um, and what that means is that half the world will very likely become uninhabitable to most humans. So you're going to have a movement of billions of people having to flee their homes, to flee their countries, or to die. It means that many low-lying island nations will be lost to rising seas, and that is consistent with the definition of genocide. It means that there will be perpetual crisis, that food networks face collapse, 
or you need 75% roughly of the, the global crops are produced in about 25% of the cropland. So if you're destabilizing the planet, if you've got the Gulf Stream is, is rapidly shifting in, in where it is because the polar ice is melting and so you're having this ice cube at the top of the planet anymore that's cooling down the air, you get disturbances to the air currents, which means that you get trapped hot and cold weather where it shouldn't exist. I, I'd love to blame that for the weather here today in Glasgow, but I think it's just Glasgow. But what we're facing, that means, is that a confluence of exponential growth economically leads to exponential growth in the number of crises that we face. So if we don't shut down this, this paradigm, we will fail. Now, there are other options. Um, and this links in very closely to what Kyle was just saying about carbon capture and storage. Because hidden in some of these models, here we can take this, this projection here in the orange line, if you can see that. We'll have more of these posters up around the city, I'm sure. <laughs> um, this orange line here shows something like a, a consistent trajectory to what humans have been following, um, if you think about it quite optimistically. But what's hidden in this pathway here is you see, actually, it does bend down. It looks like the emissions end up going down. The only way you can make that happen is by invoking large-scale deployment of carbon capture and storage technology, which doesn't exist. So the entirety of our future is being gambled on a piece of, on a, a faith that a piece of technology but will emerge to solve our problems. But there is no indication that it is going to do so, and it is a distraction from doing the hard work of systemic transformation which is necessary to confront this for crisis and to save potentially billions of lives. So the final model I'll just point to here, they do a lot of modeling, it's <laughs> hard to summarize in five minutes. But the final models I'll point to here are these lowest trajectories. Because what they represent are something of a genuine climate revolution. What those models do is instead of focusing on, on perpetual economic growth, they focus on redistribution of the wealth that already exists. <laughs> They focus on cl climate justice and equity as being fundamental to climate progress. Woo! And that means listening to the voices of the disenfranchised and the disempowered, which is one of the things that we are here to do. The people whose lives are being lost today, the people who are forced from their homes and their nations today, are not given platform to speak. And so we invisibilize them. We don't hear their voices. And that's one thing that we have to do because this is objectively true. The safest way out of this crisis is to change how we approach it. Yes. So I'll, I'll basically finish by saying I think that we, we a couple of months ago, we leaked the uh, third working group report of the IPCC. And we did that because many people don't recognize this, but those reports that you read that come out from the IPCC, they're doctored. They're not the original reports. What happens is the scientists create a report that says, this is what is the cause of a crisis, this is what we need to do about it, and then representatives from different governments go through that report line by line, and they remove or edit anything that they can't agree on. Shame. Shame, absolutely. And it endangers us all. So we leaked that report to show what it says in the words of the scientists, in the words of what is true. And we will see in March, when it is published officially, how much governments have chosen to occlude and to obscure from the public so that they can continue a destructive political and economic system that benefits only a tiny number. We're here to call that out. It's all project fear. It's all project fear. There's nothing to worry about. Look, us governments, we have never, ever, ever failed you in all of our, in all of our years of governance. <laughs> no, 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 just quiet, quiet down, okay? Quiet, quiet down. We've got it in hand, okay? We're already doing everything that we could possibly... No, 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 that's a bad idea. No, no, let's not do that. Look, look, we, we've made this lovely COP26 conference. We've brought the sun... No. 
We, we didn't do that. We, uh, but it's, it's all wonderful, and I can, I can promise you that. And if you no, just no, continue no, no, to... Oh, hush you no. over there. Look, it's going to be fine. I can, I can promise you. No, oh, but maybe, maybe you could help me out here. I'm, I'm sure that you'll be on my side, sir. Thanks, everyone. Um, the other day, scientists rebellion made history. We were the first mass arrest of scientists of the climate crisis ever. Um, it shouldn't have taken this long. We should have been on the streets 30, 40 years ago. And the reason that we took direct action is we had no, uh, we are making no demands of COP. COP has failed 25 times and it's about to be the 26th. Uh, the governments have failed us. At best, they have failed us um, for the same amount of time. So what we're doing is we are calling on the people to go into civil resistance. We need people to non-violently break the law. The system is killing us, and we have to show that we understand that, we have to act like that. And the only way to do this is to break the law peacefully, as we did, as 21 of us were arrested the other day. <laughs> Um, it's often said that the government, there's government inaction over the climate crisis. That's not true. They do plenty of action, but what they're doing is they are not our allies. They are actively funding the fossil fuel industry every year, globally in trillions of dollars a year. Um, in the UK, it's about 10 billion pounds every year is given in free money to the people who are killing us. Our they are, money! Our money is being given to those who are literally killing us uh, by the government. They are not on our side, and that's why we have a. We don't. It's not just that we have, um, like, it's moral that we are allowed to rebel. It's that we have a duty. If the government is committing treason, and when the government is doing, when it is murdering its own citizens for political gain, that is treason. There is nothing short of that. They are doing it, and they know that they're doing it. Some of them are so stupid they don't understand, but that's not an excuse. And half of them do know what they're doing, and they're just psychopathic. And we have to call that out. We only get one chance to avoid extinction, right? There's not going to be a do-over. We are currently failing miserably. Emissions are still rising, and it's COP26, right? Um, if collapse happens, that's it. Once we're dead, like once it's extinction, it's us dead forever. We can't fuck this up. We have to do everything possible. And that means acting as if your child will starve to death from this. It means acting as if this is really going to happen. And that's incredibly difficult, right? The science is terrifying and complex and confusing, but at its core, it's very simple. Either we drastically, drastically alter society, and that means removing the people currently in power and putting ourselves in power through citizens' assemblies. Unless we do that, we're all going to go down. And we have to do it now. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Maybe you're right. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So we had um, we had Dr. Charlie Garner, a conservation uh, who works in conservational science. Um, sorry. Ah, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so we had uh, Dr. Charlie Garner who works at uh, in conservation science. Thank you. Dr. Tim Hewlett, astrophysicist. Um, Kyle Topper, an environmental uh, scientist. And Mike uh, Lynch White, who is a physicist. 